Hello everyone, in this video I want to show you how our students took on the role of scientists and engineers and used the practice of biomimicry to develop nature-inspired solutions to human problems. So let's get started. Welcome back to another video of a STEM project that myself and a colleague, Tracy Blair, designed and implemented earlier this school year. It was towards the end of the unit, and I wanted to see if she was interested in trying out a performance task that was brewing in my head. Ideally, we would have co-designed and co-taught at the start of the unit, but because it was such a hectic beginning of the 2020 school year, we were all in survival mode. In this video, I would like to describe what we did during this unit but also explain the changes we would like to make to improve it for next year. The main concepts in this unit were animal and plant structure, function, and senses, as well as the NGSS cross-cutting concepts of systems and cause and effect. Next year, we also hope to focus on the concept of energy transfer. The goal of the STEM project was to have students not only acquire understanding of individual concepts, but also the conceptual relationship between them. And most importantly, have students apply their understandings of these relationships in a new real world context. This project was actually designed during the time I was taking the Learning That Transfers course created by Julie Stern and her amazing team of educators. If you want to learn more about my experience taking this course that teaches educators how to ensure students are able to transfer their learning to new and complex situations, or just want to check out uh, the course itself, please click on the links in the description below. Before we introduce the STEM performance task, Tracy and her class tried to answer the following question. Why do animals and plants need structures? They first observe structures that they see in their daily lives, such as hand tools, then move to the structures we have as humans. They found that each of the structures that they focused on had a function, a purpose that benefits an object or a living thing. Through experiments, observations, and research, students collected evidence that helped them to understand that plants and animals have internal and external structures that function to support survival, growth, behavior, and reproduction. For example, they made claims using evidence and reasoning of how animals and plants use their structures for specific functions. They observed why birds have different types of beaks, the function of the different structures of leaves and its vein of trees, and use an experiment of how plants use their stem to move water. With this understanding, we introduced the concept of biomimicry using real life examples created by engineers. According to Biomimicry Institute, biomimicry is a practice that learns from and mimics the strategies found in nature to solve human design challenges and find hope along the way. We showed how people built gecko inspired adhesives that lets people climb walls, a new paint for homes that creates self-cleaning surfaces that mimics the microstructures of a water and dirt repellent lotus plant, and a painless needle for shots that mimics the way a mosquito sucks blood from our bodies. We even showed a Vox video of how a Japanese engineer used the structures of different types of birds to improve a bullet train. After learning how people solve problems using nature-inspired designs, as a class we brainstormed some of the problems they saw around them as well as things that people might need or want or want to improve. Students then chose a couple of problems that they wanted to work on and developed how might we questions. Here are some example problems students decided to work on. How might we keep our screens on our phones from cracking? How might we stop mosquitoes from biting us? How might we help children not wet the bed? How might we help people who can't swim enjoy the pool? They then started to brainstorm ways of answering their how might we questions, focusing on quantity, encouraging creative ideas, and deferring judgment. I modeled the process by sketching out my ideas and then asking myself the following questions. What animal or plant structure could I mimic to solve the problem? How would nature answer my how might we question? Now during the same week, Students were also learning how animals receive different types of information through their senses. 
then processed the information in their brain and responded to the information in different ways. Students got to do a mystery science exploration activity where they learned how their eyes worked and explored how the structure of the lens is related to the function of their eyes. After learning about information processing and animal sensory receptors, I showed students another example of engineers using biomimicry, this time mimicking the bat's ability to use sound and echolocation with drones so that they can navigate in the dark, dust, or smoke. I then showed students a home light system to show how devices we use every day gain information through sensors and process the information to generate an output. In this system, the light sensor detects the intensity of the light level in the room and sends that information to the microprocessor. If the light level is too low, especially when it's at night, the microcomputer will then signal to the lights to turn on. I then showed them an example of a cat seeing a potential predator. Its eyes have sense receptors and receive the information. The brain processes that information and as a result, helps the cat respond uh, to what it sees. We then had a class discussion on the similarities and differences between the three examples I showed them. The goal was to have students see that these devices that involve the use of sensors and information processing are designed to meet human needs and wants. Very similar to how animals use their sensory receptors and process information to help meet their own needs, specifically for survival, growth, behavior, and reproduction. Now with this connection, I wanted the students to then brainstorm opportunities for biomimicry in regards to nature's use of sensory receptors and information processing. To do this, I introduced microcomputers and sensors to the students. Microcomputers are small computers that have microprocessors, a little chip that acts as the brain of the computer. Sensors are components that detect or measure physical property, like the amount of sound or light there is in an environment. The microcomputer I introduced to the students was the microbit, a pocket-sized computer that contains an LED light display, buttons, sensors, and many input-output features that you can program. We then talked about how these sensors are similar to the sensory receptors used by animals. Later in the year, students also got to work with EduBit, another type of breakout board that allowed you to program the microbit to then control the sensors, LEDs, and motors. Now after sketching their ideas, it was time to do some convergent thinking. We had students choose one or two ideas that they thought were the most desirable, feasible, and viable. We had them ask themselves, does their idea solve the problem? Does the structure, function, or sensory receptors uh, they mimicked help solve the problem or enhance their idea? Is it buildable? As in, can I create something tangible that can communicate my idea, like a prototype? And lastly, would people want to use it? Will it be simple to use? Now it was time for the blueprint. This is where students can map out exactly what they wanted to create. However, it was difficult for Tracy and I to approve uh, blueprints because it was difficult for us to understand the context of the idea students had. We saw the detailed sketches, but it was hard for us to know what problem they were working on or what animal or plant structure, function, or sensors they were uh, mimicking. So we created a graphic organizer that was attached to the blueprint so that Tracy and I can read and know the context before we took a look at the blueprint. Here's a look at the blueprint graphic organizer. Once students got their design signed off, they started the prototyping phase. During this phase, Tracy introduced the concept of rapid iteration. She showed a rapid iteration animation video and then gave them an example of how rapid iteration can help produce better outcomes in the same amount of time. Here's an example story. Let's say an app design team is working on a new app that needs to be finished within one year. They work on an app for almost a year and then test it out at the end to gain feedback and make quick improvements. However, let's say there was another design team working on the same type of app, but they used rapid iteration. They developed an app within a short period of time. They then tested their app to gain feedback and used the feedback to quickly make improvements. Then tested the app again on end users. They were able to test and improve their app three times. This iterative approach allowed the team to learn, adapt, 
and make modifications and improvements throughout the development of the app, which in turn produced a better outcome. I also explained to students that the prototype is an opportunity to not only uh, learn by building, exploring, and experimenting, but it was a way to communicate their ideas visually for clarity and understanding so that it elicits feedback to then improve their ideas. So prototypes are tangible things that communicate and share creative ideas to problems. Here are some of the items a students created. A device that mimics a pelican's beak to scoop trash in rivers. A hoop that contains lights that mimics the headlamp of an anglerfish to attract and encourage the family to put the laundry into the laundry basket. A flotation device that consists of small motorized paddles that move the person around the pool. These miniature paddles mimic the legs of a millipede. Another swimming device that mimics the hairs of the water boatman insect that helps it to float on the surface of the water. A device that mimics the function of a bat's ability to echolocate. This device lets people know if they are not safe distancing. A phone case that has parts of it that mimics the hard shell of a turtle and the wool of a sheep to provide the phone protection when it falls. After students built, tested, and improved their prototypes, it was time for them to share their ideas to the class. I explained to them that no matter how creative or innovative their ideas are, if they can't communicate um, them in a simple and engaging way, they can't show the value of their ideas. Then their ideas might remain just ideas and not actually materialize into anything. As an example, we showed a pitch from Shark Tank, a TV show where entrepreneurs presented ideas to a panel of inventors who will decide if they want to invest money into their idea or business plan. The example showed all the qualities of a great pitch. It showed passion from the presenter, who obviously believes in himself and his idea, as well as communicating clearly the essential message of his idea. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please click the like button if you did and subscribe to the channel for more education videos like this. Until next time, stay perpetually in beta and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.